Will you stop in the camera, Freddy? Freddy. Look at this guy's nuts. This is Roy DeMeo, spending time with his family and friends. Roy is a devoted family man, a loving husband and a father, as well as a loyal friend. However, at the same time, Roy is also the most feared figure in America, leading a crew that is considered by both law enforcement and outlaws as the most dangerous group of killers in New York's criminal underworld. This is the rise and fall of the deadliest gangster in U.S. history. Roy Albert DeMeo was born on September 7, 1940 in the historic Flatlands neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York, as the fourth child of working-class Italian immigrants. By all accounts, he was raised in a normal middle-class family with no real ties to any kind of crime. However, Roy DeMeo had different plans. He was motivated by money deciding at an early age that he would stop at nothing to obtain it, and crime was obviously the fastest way to achieve it. He would later say that he was always the black sheep in his family, as his parents, particularly his mother, always wanted him to become a doctor. And well, to be fair, while he certainly didn't become a doctor, he probably saw more human insights than any New York doctor working at the time. Roy DeMeo graduated from James Madison High School in 1959, by that time, Roy already began his criminal career, earning money as a loan shark. He had developed a street reputation for being a dirty and violent fighter, which ensured his customers would promptly pay their principal and vig. The foundation of his future criminal connections started to build themselves during this time. The base of his operations was Phil's Lounge, which was a neighborhood bar a few blocks away from his childhood home in Flatlands. It would later be reborn as the Gemini Lounge, after Roy became its secret owner. Now, just as a quick side note to better understand the story ahead, it's important to quickly outline the structure of the Italian-American Mafia. In New York City, there are five crime families, each functioning as a separate criminal organization with the same hierarchical structure. At the top is the boss, he is the leader of the whole organization. An example would be Vito Corleone in The Godfather and Tony Soprano in The Sopranos. Each boss has a trusted advisor called a consigliere, that was Tom Hagen to Vito in The Godfather, and that was Silvio to Tony in The Sopranos. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. The consigliere is the boss's trusted and wise right-hand man who accompanies the boss to his meetings. Directly under the boss is the underboss, who is second in command and oversees all activities beneath him. Usually, he has a position of the street boss, acting as a bridge between the boss and the rest of the organization. Below the underboss are the capo regimes, or capos for short. These are the captains, each running their own crew of soldiers. The number of soldiers under each capo varies. In Goodfellas, Paul Cicero is an example of a capo. In Sopranos, Uncle Polly is an example of one. Commendator. Soldiers are the lowest rank in the mafia, working under the capos. They earn money doing various criminal activities and they pass a chunk of their earnings up the chain to the capos, who then pass it to the underboss and finally to the boss. Now all of these members are so-called made men, meaning they are fully initiated into the mafia. You know all that secret omerta code of silence ritual BS from the Sopranos. This family comes before everything else. Everything. Before your wife and your children and your mother and your father. It's a thing of honor. Yeah, so all of them underwent it. They are a fully initiated member of the crime family, and nobody can touch them unless the boss gives the okay. Everyone else in the criminal structure is an associate. Associates can be anyone working for and benefiting the crime family, from low-level street criminals to powerful gangsters. Although I previously mentioned the Prefacis and the Colombo crime family, Roy DeMeo wouldn't associate with them. During his beginnings, Roy initially became an associate of the Brooklyn faction of the Lucchese crime family. Naturally, because they controlled tow truck companies, junkyards and car theft operation in Flatlands. However, when Roy was in his mid-twenties, his potential was noticed by Nino Gaggi, a soldier and later capo in the Gambino crime family, who told him that he could earn even more money if he became an associate for the Gambinos under Nino, which Roy accepted. 
Now, besides his loan sharking operation, which grew exponentially after he associated with the Gambinos, the Mayo slowly began developing a crew of young men involved in car theft. This collective of colorful figures working for Roy DeMeo would eventually spread their portfolio of criminal activities to almost anything imaginable. They will become known in both the underworld and law enforcement circles as the DeMeo crew. The first member to join the crew was 16-year-old Chris Rosenberg, who met DeMeo in 1966 when he was dealing marijuana at a gas station in Canarsie. Eventually, DeMeo and Rosenberg became close and Rosenberg introduced his friends to DeMeo, who also started working for him. These were the founding members of the infamous DeMeo crew. The list included Joseph and Patrick Testa, Anthony Center, Richard and Frederick Denomi, Henry Borelli, Joseph Guglielmo, nicknamed Dracula, and later, Vito Reina and Carlo Profeta. The 1970s was a time of rapid growth for DeMeo and his goo they slowly but surely expanded their operations onto every available corner of the underworld they could grasp. His loan sharking and car theft operations grew exponentially. In fact, during the 1970s, his car theft operation would become the largest in Europe's history. Dubbed the Empire Boulevard operation by the FBI, the DeMeo crew would ship the stolen cars from the port of Newark to Puerto Rico and even the Middle East. He was selling cars, he got stolen cars, put them on a ship, 20 of them, 30 of them, 40 of them at a time, and shipped them to Kuwait. And he was selling them for five, eight, ten thousand 10,000 cheaper than it would cost you to buy it in the showroom. And it only cost him a couple of hundred dollars to pay thieves to rob the car. So it cost him hardly nothing. I don't know what the shipping cost, but he was making a fortune. You can almost bet that if your car was stolen during that time, it was done by the DeMeo crew. Even fellow mobsters weren't safe. Roy, you know, interesting happened. He had a chop shop. You know, he was cutting up cars. Mm. And I had two Jaguars at one time, and they were both stolen on the same day from the same area. So fortunately, I realized it in the morning because they work on these cars really quick. And I got in touch with Roy, and I said, Roy, you got two Jaguars. They're probably mine. Uh, he said, Mike, let me look it up. And he found him, and I got the cars back that, that <laughs> later that day. He was about to chop them up, huh? He was about to chop them, yeah. Okay. Now, besides that, the DeMeo crew also got involved in drug trafficking, hijacking, prostitution, and even s***. Now, obviously, the last one was an extreme no-no in the eyes of his superior Nino Gaggi. But by that time, the DeMeo crew became so powerful, and they were earning so much money for the Gambinos, that Gaggi let that one slide. The exuberant amounts of money were laundered through various legal businesses. For instance, in 1972, the Mayo joined the Brooklyn Credit Union and gained a position on the board of directors, which he utilized to launder his ill-gotten gains. Of course, besides that, there were the usual money laundering businesses. A lot of the times, when his loan shark customers couldn't pay back what they owed, he would become the secret owner of whatever they had to offer. So Roy DeMeo laundered money through car dealerships, restaurants, bars, a dentist office, an abortion clinic, flea markets, even a p establishment. However, all of these criminal acts, while disturbing, aren't the reason why the DeMeo crew became so infamous and feared. You see, while the crew was a lucrative source of income for the Gambinos through their various operations, the thing they were most sought out for was their expertise in murder and dismemberment. Throughout the 1970s, the DeMeo crew became known as the most feared group of hitmen in New York City. Their services were used not only by the Gambinos, but also other crime families. They became so famous for it that their method of killing even developed a name, the Gemini Method named after the Gemini Lounge, which was the headquarters of Roy DeMeo and his gang of murderers. Here's how they would execute the method. In almost all cases, the crew would somehow lure their targets through the side door of the Gemini Lounge into an apartment in the back portion of the building. After entering the apartment, a crew member, almost always Roy DeMeo himself, would approach the target with a silenced pistol in one hand and a towel in the other shooting the victim in the head and then immediately wrapping the towel around the victim's wound like a turban to stanch the blood flow. Before he would even wrap the towel, another crew member would stab the victim through the heart to prevent further blood pumping through the head wound. Most of the time, the stabber was Chris Rosenberg, who would do it naked as he didn't want the blood messing his clothes. 
by then the victim would be dead, at which point the body would be stripped of clothing and dragged in the bathroom, where they left the body for a short period of time so that the remaining blood would drain out and congeal within the body. This was to eliminate the messiness of the next step, when the crew members would place the body onto plastic sheets laid out in the main room and proceed to dismember it, cutting off the arms, legs and head. I walked in there one, one night, because on Friday nights we all used to eat in there. And I walked in there and you could see in the bathroom there was two naked bodies hanging, you know, in the shower by their feet with their throats cut. And they already bled out because there was no blood coming out. And I walked in and, you know, there was a spaghetti and everybody's eating and stuff like that. And I looked into the bathroom and I, I told Roy, the mayor, I said, what the f is that? He said, ah, don't worry, they're not staying for dinner. <laughs> Following the dismemberment, the body parts would be then put into bags, placed in cardboard boxes and sent to the Fountain Avenue landfill in Brooklyn. So many tons of garbage were dropped each day at the dump that it would be nearly impossible for the bodies to be discovered. In fact, during the initial stages of an early 1980s investigation targeting the DeMeo crew, a plan by the authorities to excavate sections of the dump to locate remains was aborted when it was deemed too costly and unlikely to locate any meaningful evidence. Of course, a few of their executions were carried out in different ways usually leaving the body in public places to send a chilling message and a warning to their enemies. Now you might be thinking, ah, I watched all the mob movies and TV shows. Yeah, it's gruesome and dark, but this was just a regular hit crew. What's the big fuss about them? Well, the fuss is that the exact number of the Mayo victims is unknown, but they estimate it to be anywhere between 50 and 200 murders. According to many ex-high-ranking mafia figures, the sanctioned hit isn't that common of a thing. I mean, don't get me wrong, it definitely happened on a yearly basis, but to sanction a murder of someone in that world is a serious decision that is not lightly made. Murder was not a first action, it was always a last resort, you know, and in our life it was very serious, only the boss can okay it, you know, if something had to go down, the boss would, would give the final word on that and then whatever happened, happened from that point. But. I think a lot of people get the impression, especially from movies, we just went around killing people every day, like some of these young kids today. Not the truth. So where the heck did the DeMeo crew gather 200 hits? Well, that's where the true creepiness of the crew lies. They weren't just killing on orders, they were killing anyone who stepped in their way. In fact, according to some, they began to love killing so much that they crossed that blurry line between a gangster and a serial killer. This guy crossed the line. He's killed so many people, I think he's becoming a serial killer. Reportedly, hanging out in and near the Gemini Lounge was somewhat of a Russian roulette. Allegedly, they would sometimes pick lowlifes hanging out at the lounge late at night to quote-unquote exercise their skills. He had a club, and on the corner of the club was a bar. So he says, at night, we're in the club playing cards. The bartender, they used to call him Dracula who was his uncle, would call him up. There's one guy who's a little drunk. He's the only guy left. They'd stop playing cards. Stop playing cards. Come on, let's go. They go in the bar. They snatch the guy. They kill him. What did the guy do? Nothing, Sam. You know, you, I got to keep the guy sharp. To give you another example of his craziness, during the late 1970s, the Mayo hunted down and murdered a college student called Dominic Ragucci, who had no criminal ties whatsoever. Why? Well, because Ragucci worked as a door-to-door -door salesman to pay for his tuition. And well, good old Roy DeMeo thought he was a Cuban assassin. And so Roy and his crew members hunted him down in a seven-mile car chase on Route 10, after which they shot him to death. By the beginning of the 1980s, the DeMeo crew became the most feared gang of killers in Hall of New York. To quickly get back to the Mafia hierarchy, Roy DeMeo never became a capo. He was officially a maid member and a soldier under Nino Gaggi, who became a capo regime. However, the DeMeos were such good earners and so powerful and feared that Roy was almost considered a captain in his own regard. He had a good relationship with his boss Nino, but to my understanding, Roy DeMeo was so feared during his prime that even Nino couldn't tell him what to do. 
you know, I remember when Roy DeMail used to come, who everybody knows who he is, you know, the butcher or whatever. I remember he used to come here on Saturdays and he would walk in and everybody would just like stare at him. Like people actually would stop talking when he walked in. He was a wild card, a rich, uncontrollable grim reaper running rampant on the streets of New York. This, along with the fact that FBI was starting to delve deeper into an enormous number of missing and murdered persons linked to DeMeo, was starting to become a huge problem for the Gambino family leadership. Then boss of the family, Paul Castellano, had enough. Roy DeMeo had to go. However, the Gambinos had a difficulty finding someone willing to execute a hit on DeMeo. Everyone feared him, even the infamous future boss of the family, John Gotti. During the planning of the DeMeo hit, an FBI bug was placed in the home of Gambino's capo Angelo Ruggiero. The FBI recorded a conversation between Ruggiero and John Gotti's brother, Gene Gotti, where Gene mentioned that Castellano wanted John to execute the hit on DeMeo, but the famous mobster was weary of taking the contract, as DeMeo had an army of killers around him. It was also mentioned during the recorded conversation that, at the time, John killed fewer than 10 people, while DeMeo killed 37 that they'd known about. Eventually, the contract was supposedly given to Frank DeChico, a future Gambino family underboss. However, even him and his crew couldn't reach DeMeo. He was seemingly untouchable. However, according to some sources, DeChico allegedly managed to hand the job to some of DeMeo's own men. DeMeo's son Albert later wrote in his book that during his father's final days, Roy DeMeo was paranoid and knew he would die soon. He was always wearing a leather jacket with a shotgun concealed underneath. Roy even considered faking his own death by having his son Albert shoot him. However, on January 10, 1983, Roy DeMeo went to the house of one of his crew members, Patrick Testa, and well, he never returned home. His frozen body was discovered 10 days later in the truck of his own Cadillac Coupe de Ville. He was shot multiple times in the head and had a bullet wound in both of his hands, assumed by law enforcement to be a defensive wound caused by raising his hands when his killers opened fire on him. What's ironical about this whole situation is that Gambino boss Castellano's ultimately successful hit on the mail actually sealed his own fate as John Gotti orchestrated Castellano's assassination on December 16, 1985, assuming the throne as the boss of the family. According to many, Gotti and his associates would never have dared to move against Castellano while the male was still alive, as the male's superior, Nino Gaggi, was a close associate of Castellano's and became a capo under him, and Roy the male himself became a made man during Castellano's reign. But hey, gangsters killing gangsters, what's new?